Descendants of the Diaspora are launching a movement in Minnesota to find connection to the land and return to ancestral roots of farming. Follow us as we farm our way home. I am a farmer, educator, activist. This season, I'm working with Frogtown Farm in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been farming couple different versions of it for probably about 10 years. My initial interest was around health and fitness. Um, sometime after college I just sort of figured out everyone around me was suffering from some sort of field of food related illness, including my mom, and how we may think that we're eating healthy or, you know, eating a a healthy diet compared to um, current, what's currently being told to us, um, but that doesn't take into consideration that our food is, you know, sprayed with chemicals or our, the meat that we eat is, you know, pumped up with steroids and that also has an effect on our health. Um, I became more interested in teaching people about, um, you know, how to eat. And somewhere along the lines, I figured out that what I was teaching people was wrong. And then I discovered that there was a, a much deeper um, racial, cultural, socioeconomic justice issue tied to our food system. Um, so I began to try to learn how to grow food and um, you know, quickly figured out that um, it didn't really seem like something that was for me. Every training course or every organic certification course or permaculture course that I went to, I was the only black person. Nationwide, less than 2% of farmers are black. Here in Minnesota, we're fighting to change that trend. The Women's Environmental Institute, co-founded by former Representative Karen Clark, is one of those organizations. I think that white people can help uh, support um, the kind of environmental justice work that needs to be done, um, both with, um, i say, resources, with determination to make sure that the people who are um, being um, connected with um, in our communities of color and Native American communities actually have some of the same doors opened, if there's some white privilege there that would allow that to happen, um, if there's resources. Um, and one of the really important things is that that group is in charge. Food apartheid is uh, basically describes um, what's happening in black and brown communities. Um, there's, there's access to food, but it's processed food or you know, processed high sugar foods. Um, it's kind of what the USDA calls um, food deserts, right? But it's intentional, you know. So I've, I've, I've been in the desert. I've seen people grow food in the desert. So food desert, is, I don't think, is a very accurate term. It's a natural occurrence. Um, what's happening is intentional. Um, it's very intentional that, you know, you know, throughout history, control our food, control us. Uh. My name is Melvin Giles. Uh, my organization is The Universe. Uh, I'm fortunate to work with people part of the Urban Farm and Garden Alliance. Uh, this year marks the 400 year of Africans being in this country. Uh, 1619, uh, Jamestown. And when black folks first came here, the one way we survived was off the land. This is the Rora St. Anthony Peace Garden. This particular garden is planted by the children of the neighborhood. Part of the Farm Garden Alliance. We definitely want people to reconnect back to the land. We are learning that growing our food is like wealth, growing wealth. The black farmers in America are trying to reclaim that again.
This project is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts on the web at arts.gov. My name's Eni Augustine. I'm a web designer, tech nerd, blurred. I'm going to be doing my documentary on food justice and the importance of black people, brown people, growing their own food, harvesting their own food, and building a relationship with the land. I think that that's important, especially, again, for black and brown people because so much of who we are is who we've been told we are. Um, now that we're defining it for ourselves, you know, we should have control of the entire process from food to clothing to education, you know, to creating who we are, I feel. I want to capture black connection and joy. See, because the thing is, is that if you don't know your land, you don't belong to the land. And if you don't belong to the land, you don't have a home. So, so many of us are, for lack of a better word, homeless right now. In America, specifically, we have a manufactured idea of what it means to be black. If I'm black, I listen to hip hop music. If I'm black, I wear my hair in braids. If I'm black, I you know, have X, Y, and Z experiences. But blackness is so deep and so varied, and there's a wide range of people. I really want to capture the depth and truth of that experience. And so that means telling stories that aren't classically black because I believe that this idea of classic blackness isn't true or accurate because it wasn't developed by black people themselves.